So hi everyone, nice to see you online again. Uh, hopefully you're doing well. Of course, I know that you're in England. Be very happy to have that extra hour sleep. And of course, from next week, it's that extra two hours sleep. You don't have to get up at 5.30 in the morning. So um, for us Australians, of course, I just remind you that yes, tonight we should change the clocks. Now I put the clocks back uh, to the standard time away from daylight savings. So it's going to get dark quite early in the evening now. Anyway, I um, uh, hope you have been practicing well in the last week um, and, you know, continue to improve, continue to be consistent uh, with your practice and be accurate with the practice. Try not to try your best not to get complacent, but also don't stress about it either. You know, the Dharma practice is nothing to stress over. Don't put pressure on yourself too much, you know. In fact, at all, don't put pressure at all on yourself. Uh, but practice consistently, constantly. You know, if ever we fall off the path, make a mistake along the way, just recognize it as such and, um, you know, make a resolve to have a, have a small amount of regret, you could say. Um, positive regret, non-clinging regret and then have resolved to do your best not to let it happen again. And eventually over time, it won't happen. Okay, so just um, be happy with yourself. Rejoice in all of the good deeds, all of your good qualities, and but also recognize your faults that need to be relinquished as well with joy. Okay, it's a good thing to perceive our faults, by the way. Otherwise, we won't do anything about it, and they will just continue to reinforce themselves and get bigger and bigger over time. So let's do the chanting now before our meditations and the continuing commentary on the eight verses of thought transformation. Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Buddham saranam gachami, dhammam saranam gachami, sangham saranam gachami, Tudayambi buddham saranam gachami, Tudayambi dhammam saranam gachami, Tudayambi sangham saranam gachami, Tatayambi buddham saranam gachami, Tatayambi dhammam saranam gachami, Tatayambi sangham saranam gachami. Namo buddhaya, namo dharmaya, namo sanghaya, namo buddhaya, namo dharmaya, namo sanghaya, namo buddhaya, namo dharmaya, namo sanghaya. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six paramitas, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six paramitas, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six paramitas, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and its causes. May they be free from suffering and its causes. May they never be parted from the happiness beyond suffering. May they abide in equanimity, free of bias, attachment to the near, and aversion from the far. I shall cause this great compassionate Buddha, please inspire me to be able to do so. Reverently I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind, and present clouds of every types of offerings, actual and mentally transformed. 
I confess all of my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in all the virtues of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until cyclic existence ends and turn the wheel of Dharma for all sentient beings. I dedicate the virtues of myself and others to the great enlightenment. However innumerable all sentient beings are, I vow to save them all. However inexhaustible my delusions are, I vow to extinguish them all. However immeasurable the Dharma teachings are, I vow to master them all. However endless the Buddha's way is, I vow to follow it completely. Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum. Um mani padme. Kayata um gati gati para gati para sam gati bodhi suha. Tayata um gati gati para gati para sam gati bodhi suha. Tayata um gati gati para gati para sam gati bodhi suha. So now time for some meditation. Initially to release the tension from the body. So get yourself in a nice position now. Bring your mind inside your body. And we will release the tension from the tips of the toes, all the way up your legs, then all the way up to your shoulders, down to the tips of your fingers, and then back up to your neck and the whole of your head, the top of your head. So let's take a few moments to do this now. Now scan your body again, just to see if there's any leftover tension that you can release. Now we will practice breath meditation. Anapanasati, mindfulness of the breath. Follow the feeling of the breath as you breathe in your nose all the way into your lungs and then back out your nose again. Try your best to keep your mind seamlessly on the feeling of the breath. Breathing in, breathing out with joy, with calmness, balance. You can also add the extra technique of counting the breaths, one in breath, one out breath is one and so on. Don't count past 10. And if you get distracted while you're counting the breaths towards 10, then go back to one at that time. Remember this extra technique is there to help you to focus on the breath. The breath is the focus. If thoughts arise or any mental activity arises, don't cling to it, grasp at it, try to force it away or deny it, but simply and gently just replace your mind back onto your breath. And this may happen often sometime in meditation sessions, depending on how distracted you are. But over time, we will improve. It becomes natural to practice this. Just like when we're a baby, we can't walk straight away. And then after some time, we start to learn to walk after a, maybe a year to, I don't know how long actually, after a period of time. And then you fall over a lot. So you're able to then have balance and strength in your legs. And then normally you've been able to walk uh, well, of course, that example is limited, but um, I think you get what I mean. Same with meditation practice. In the beginning, it becomes, it's maybe even feels like you're having more thoughts. I've heard people say that before. 
oh, when I meditate, I have more thoughts than when I don't. Actually, what's happening is you're noticing it. You're recognizing how distracted the mind is. I will repeat, if thoughts arise, mental activity arises, don't cling, don't grasp, don't try to force it away or deny that it's there, but gently replace your mind back onto the breath. And if your mind starts to become dull, you become sleepy, then place your mind or replace your mind back onto your breath more brightly. So let's practice like this for a few minutes in silence. So now we can feel pleased with ourselves for engaging in this breath meditation. And while keeping the meditative state of mind that you have nice and calm and clear, attentive, unattached, you listen to the instruction and put this instruction into practice in Tibetan, the Tonglen meditation practice. Translated to English, giving, taking. Because last week we had, uh, I used this as part of the commentary on verse 7 of the eight verses of thought transformation. Um, so today it will be much shorter without the extra details. So first of all, bring to mind the suffering of others. 
even if this starts off by you thinking of the difficulties and sufferings that you experience every day, sometimes bigger, more intense, sometimes not as much, realize that all living beings experience difficulties like this, even if it's not exactly the same. One thing you can be sure is that we all experience aging or birth, aging, death, and other difficulties along the way, and sicknesses, both from the point of view of mental difficulties as well as physical difficulties. And really have the wish, even if it's forced to begin with, that you want to free them from their suffering. So many of these living beings, they don't even know that they're able to do this themselves. They have no idea of the law of karma and how to, if you don't want the result or the effect of suffering, then you must abandon the cause and eventually purify the mind the three poisons for bringing to mind the suffering of others to develop this compassion, this bodhicitta intention, as well as to decrease, eventually eradicate your self-centeredness. And now we'll start out by visualizing a loved one in front of you. At very most, like I said, maybe two or three, but best to just stick with one at the moment. So one person in front of you could be your mother. I'll add a little footnote here as well. You can actually take uh, engage in this practice by uh, visualizing or imagining that your mother and father are on either side of you as you practice like this. And if you choose to do that, then obviously the person, the loved one in front of you is someone other than them. So now visualize that you are taking this suffering upon yourself, taking it away from them. At the same time, relieving them from the suffering and also diminishing, eventually destroying your ego, your self-centeredness. So visualize the black smoke coming from their heart center and entering into your heart center. It doesn't remain there, by the way. I like to say this, that you know, if people are really suffering, sometimes they say, give me your suffering, and then I will just let it go to the universe to infinite space. As soon as you let it go, let, it, let go of the causes, you no longer have it. You put down the bags. So you, may, you can apply that type of teaching to this practice. And now visualize someone in front of you that is like a stranger. as well as your loved one. And you take their suffering in the form of the black smoke from their heart center into your heart center. And now also, God is an enemy. You do likewise. Relieve them of their suffering Take it upon yourself and destroy your self-centeredness. <clears throat> and now visualize all sentient beings. I know that's difficult to do, but just have this image in front of you with oh, so many li living beings, you know, the different types of beings, not just humans, animals, the ones are in the waters, on the land. They are in front of you now. And you take from their heart center, the black smoke comes into your heart center, relieving them of their sufferings. 
destroying your self-centeredness. Just another little footnote. I'm doing it slightly different today. If you remember last week that we would do our loved one, take the suffering and then give all of our happiness and then go on to the stranger. So I thought I'd give you another sort of like a, you can say a sub technique. Um, it's up to you how you practice. You can alternate. But also I think familiarity is, uh, especially when we're starting to learn a, a certain practice, that maybe you pick one, stick with that for a period. So that part of the visualization, and let's go back now to your loved one in front of you. And from your heart center, you give the white light into their heart center, all of your happiness, all of your good karma, merits, virtues, and all of the material things that you find pleasing as well. You give to them, giving up your attachment and benefiting them and bringing happiness to them. And now also include a stranger and do likewise. and an enemy and do likewise. And now all living beings, just like before, except this time, of course, we're giving all of our goodness, all of our merits, all of the things we find pleasing to them in the form of this white light from your heart center to their heart center, making them happy. Freeing yourself from attachment. And now we will keep the visualization of the infinite living beings or as many as you can in front of you. We won't go through the stages uh, today. And now we will do the inhaling. As you inhale, you will Take the black smoke from their heart center. Take all of their sufferings upon yourself. Black smoke now comes into your heart center, destroys your ego. And on the exhale, you will give the white light, all of your goodness and all the things you find pleasing to them from the, your heart center to their heart center. So let's do that for a short period. Do your best to really feel that this is happening when you are taking their suffering, that they are really free from suffering. And at the same time, you are developing more compassion and also lessening your attachment to self, lessening your ignorance, eventually to unveil the supreme wisdom. And when you are giving your happiness and all the goodness, Really perceive this as happening. You are freeing yourself from all attachment to this. At the same time, helping them to be happy. Just a few more in-breaths and out-breaths. Now you can cease the visualization, but still remain in the meditative state. And let's do the dedication prayer. Due to this merit, may I soon attain the enlightened state of the Buddha, so that I may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their suffering. May the precious body, Chitta, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. <laughs> 
And may the precious view of Shunyata not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline but increase forevermore. So the eight verses of thought transformation. And I just figured that today I'd give uh, another overview, which is some slightly different points. I also reiterate important points. And um, maybe not quite finish that for the, all the eight verses today, but we will finish for sure next week. And also next week, um, I will uh, recite a prayer or verses to generate bodhicitta. Of course, we're already doing that in our preliminary prayers for each class, but um, this is a slightly longer one. Okay, so, and up to you, if you um, recite it after me, I'll do it line by line, and then you can do it by yourself. And um, working to generate the bodhicitta. Okay, so the, we will do that next week with a little bit of commentary on that. Though, of course, you already have a lot of commentary you've had um, uh, during the commentary on the six parameters on the relative bodhicitta and even ultimate bodhicitta when we talk about the wisdom. Okay, so um, and then, of course, we'll start to dissect each verse. Um, the first one, um, I have taken notes a couple of months ago on this and had some new ideas as well and added to it. So it will take um, a bit of time. And um, each, I just share with you, traditionally what happens with the Dharma talks when we're working off scripts, uh, scriptures um, or texts that are in, especially in this like verse form, cryptic type verse form, um, you tend to get a lot of commentary on the first verse, second, maybe third, um, longer, and then the, the verses that come later, maybe shorter, uh, because we already cover them, because they're all interrelated, interconnected, we cover them in the commentary on the first few verses. So just know that the first verse will be quite, commentary will be quite long, and maybe a few weeks, um, and then uh, after that it will be, some of them maybe longer, but mostly a little bit shorter, okay? So so don't worry, we won't go on forever, though we're, there is no time limit as, as per usual. Um, I do. I have actually worked out what the next subject is. I won't mention it right now, but I think um, it, it would be very good, actually, teaching by Master Atisha. Okay, so... Um, I just look at my notes. So first of all, the, the first verse, uh, with the wish to attain enlightenment for the welfare of all sentient beings who are more precious than a wish-fulfilling jewel, I will constantly practice holding them dear. So this first verse, um, one is requesting, may I be able to view all beings as a precious jewel. They are the object on whose account I can achieve enlightenment. Remember, without this altruistic this bodhicitta altruistic compassionate intention is impossible for us to uh, attain full enlightenment of a Buddha. Okay. Um, it is absolutely essential that we develop this bodhicitta. But I must say this as well, but it's not enough. Of course, we have to develop or unveil the supreme wisdom and then unify them. This becomes then the ultimate bodhicitta. Um, so it's, we're kind of thinking, may I be able to hold them dear as something that is beyond precious even, okay, as essential on the path. The next, the second verse is that when I am with others, I will practice seeing myself as the lowest of all, and from the very depth of my heart, I will respectfully hold them as supreme. Um, is that correct? Yeah, that's it. Okay, so number two, uh, my notes here are saying respectfully holding others as being supreme means, <coughs> excuse me, not regarding them as an object of pity. That's really important because if we pity others, this is giving rise to our ego, isn't it? When we pity others, it's like we are, even if it's very subtle, we are putting ourselves above them. This verse and this practice is to achieve the opposite. Excuse me while I have a little sip. So, not regarding them as an object of pity, because that is kind of looking down on them, rather perceiving them as higher objects, 
as higher beings, more important than us. Even if we have to use our imagination a bit, even if we bring to mind some beings that may be very ignorant, you know, the way they behave or the, the mind, the way they think, the, the way they behave. Actually, we can use our imagination. They are now closer to enlightenment than us, for instance, to use an example. Um, another example is insects. Uh, they are inferior to us. They do not know the proper things to adopt and abandon. Think about that. We as human beings have the opportunity to know what to adopt, what to abandon. Adopting the bodhicitta, for instance, adopting all of the other parameters, all of the good qualities, and abandoning all of the kaleshas, all the mental afflictions, such as ignorance, attachment, and the like. We know because we can see the destructive nature of defilement. If we allow ourselves the opportunity, we actually can perceive quite clearly how destructive these mental afflictions are, this ignorance, this attachment, this aversion, all of the others they give rise to, jealousies and the like. Um, but, excuse me, another viewpoint, while we are While we are able to perceive, my writing is really, uh, really messy here, um, the destructive nature of the defilements, we don't correct it. If we did, we would already be enlightened. We haven't so far corrected these defilements. We haven't uprooted these defilements as yet. Even though we know about it, we have the uh, level of consciousness, you could say, that can perceive this as human beings. But we didn't do it yet. Now, we are under the influence of the defilements and our six senses. Rather than turning them around to be useful for us on the path to enlightenment, we're actually controlled by them. Maybe not all the time, but most of the time as sentient beings. So I'll reiterate that. We know what it is that we need to adopt and we know what it is we need to abandon but we haven't done it yet in this sense you could say and this comes this example comes from his holiness dalai lama that i'm just embellishing a little bit um in this sense you could say that we are inferior to the insects because the insects actually cannot perceive what to adopt what to abandon and therefore can't implement the practice, can't put the methods into practice where we can, but we, we haven't done it yet, not perfectly anyway. So that's a, a good way to look at uh, other living beings, even the ones that we know for sure don't have the level of consciousness that we have at the moment, okay? So um, verse number three, uh, when engaged in a practice like this, uh, the verse, by the way, is in all actions, I will examine my mind in the moment a disturbing attitude arises in danger of myself and others, I will firmly confront and avert it. So looking after your mind, you know, really perceiving clearly your faults and defilements, if you like, or mental afflictions. As soon as this negative um, clinging type of attitude arises that is harmful for our, our practice and even harmful for others if we follow through with it, then follow through with words and physical actions, then um, we should recognize it and then immediately let it go. Immediately abandon it. Okay. So um, when uh, engaged in a practice like this, we can realize the only thing which causes obstacles is the defilement within our own mind our own mental continuum. Outside influence does not cause the obstacles on the path. But so often we blame outside things, don't we? We blame others making us angry. In fact, we say that often, I think. Oh, this person made me angry. Actually, the anger <clears throat> is in your own mind. You're the one that is responsible for that. And the fact that that is the case 
is really cool because it means that you can fix it. As I've mentioned before, if it was somebody else that's making you angry, then it's up to them for your anger to go away. But actually, you can fix it immediately. Of course, anger is regarded as the most destructive emotion. So um, that's why I use it as an example. Okay, but it's um, likewise with all of the other mental afflictions or emotions as well. Okay. Um, avoid an attitude of idleness or laziness, complacency or passive, passivity towards the inner enemy. Remember the inner enemy? Quite often we can say the three poisons. Now, a lot of the time, some people looking, you know, they're practicing the Dharma more outwardly in a sense. Um, I can't find better words than that today. But they would look at Mara. Now, Mara, if you compare it to other religions, this is kind of like devil in a sense, but it's not like that really, okay? Um, there are four types of Mara. There is the negative being, the big guy, negative. Of course, this will change all the time. It's not eternal being, of course. Within samsara, nothing is eternal. Um, then you have the little Maras, you could say, many different types of negative beings. Um, and then, of course, you have the Mara of the five skandhas, the, the Mara of our form, feelings, thoughts, impulses, and consciousness. And then you have the Mara of afflictions. I say to people most of the time, you need to pay attention to that one. Yes, maybe five skandhas too. But actually, pay attention to the Mara of the afflictions. And in this practice, in this verse, we want to um, destroy them or overcome them, you should say, uh, immediately. Don't let them grow like weeds in the garden, grow very quickly, become overwhelming. Same with these mental afflictions. If you follow it and then react with it, you know, anger, again, I'll use it as, as an example. Once we're fully blown angry, very difficult to bring it back at that time. So that's why we should attack it immediately, all right? Let it go, overcome it immediately. Um, rather, be alert, honest, aware, conscientious, and counter defilements immediately. Verse number, I think we've only got a minute to go. Wow, time went so fast. Um, I'll try to keep the... Um, Actually, now that I think about it, I'll keep the uh, giving, taking meditation, just the one technique, I think, as I mentioned last week, because that way you have more time for a Dharma talk. Okay, so we can't really get into the next one because it's actually about three paragraphs that I've written in notes. Um, so we've covered three of them today and we will finish the, the next week. And even if I wait till the week after to do the Bodhisattva or Bodhicitta, generation of the body chitta okay keep practicing well i hope you've enjoyed today's class and i look forward to seeing you next week and look after your mind and look after yourself physically as well and don't be hard on yourself be kind to yourself and to others i rejoice in your meritorious goodness namo buddhaya Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sankara.